But today is, is starting a four-week series entitled Unto Us, where we're going to be unwrapping this message, the Christmas story. And mine this morning specifically is from the book of Isaiah about the virgin birth. Now, a little table setting first. A little table setting about this is that the Old Testament is everything that happened before Jesus was born in the front of your Bible. And the New Testament is everything that happened after Jesus in the back of your Bible. And I'm doing that because I want you to know something that in the Old Testament, Amos 3.7, we got to get this point nailed to get the rest of it. In Amos 3.7, prophets were men that God chose to speak to directly. God would give them warnings for the people. He would give them answers for the people. He would work through the prophets and do amazing miracles to tell the people, I approve this message. What this man, what this prophet is telling you, I approve of. And we'll be looking at a promise God made to his people this morning about Jesus 700 years before Jesus was born. So see, Israel was going through a time right now where it was not too good. They just needed something good to happen. They just wanted some good news. And you know, God can give you an answer in just seconds. He, he parted the Red Sea immediately. Moses needed the miracle. Boom, let's do it. It's done. Millions of gallons of water held back on both sides for that miracle to take place. But the truth is, it doesn't always come when we want it. The truth is, some of us are Lazarus' sister. When Jesus comes down the road, she goes, it's too late. He's been dead for days. Forget it, Jesus. We called you. We cried. We asked you, God, we've been praying for this forever. It's too late. And Jesus just laughs and goes, it's never too late. As the song says, God's always on time. Lazarus, get out, come forward, and get out of there. And he did. He rose the dead. So what people thought was late was right on time for God. So, yeah, he can do miracles right when you need them. But sometimes it doesn't always work that way. And what we're going to talk about this morning is Israel had been waiting for their promise for 700 years. But it was worth every second they waited. Now, let's look at the time and the situation that brought about one of the most accurate prophecies that's ever been given about Jesus. This promise was made in the seventh book of Isaiah, verses 1 through 17. And in the day that Isaiah lived, the prophet, the family of Israel was divided. They were arguing. They were fighting. And now that is a Christmas message right there, right? As we, we gather together this time of the year, and family's like, oh, is so-and-so coming? And, and you, know, you know, here's what we should have done. Scott, make a note of this. We just ended our At the Movie series, right? And we're going into our Christmas series. Next year, that last At the Movies should be Christmas vacation. Tie it right in, right? We could talk about disappointment. You know, when Clark takes the lights and they don't work. Or, or we could use uh, Aunt Bethany's blessing. You know, or, or we could talk about um, love your enemies. Where, where uh, Eddie comes over and empties his RV, right? Well, you know, we got some obstacles to work around. But I think we can make that work. Let's see if we can do that next year. We're, we'll find us a Christmas movie there. But now back to the message. The Jewish people have been divided into two kingdoms. There was the northern kingdom of Israel, and there was the southern kingdom of Judah. And they didn't like each other, and they were fighting back and forth. And the southern kingdom of Judah, their king, Ahaz, had heard a rumor that Israel had teamed up with Syria and was going to come and whoop him. So here is King Ahaz, and he's worried because he's heard this rumor about what might happen. He's worried about rumors being spread about them. Now, this is 2,700 years ago because it was 2,000 years ago, plus or minus, when Jesus was born. And this took place 700 years before that. So 2,700 years ago, they were having the same problems we're having today. Do we not worry ourselves sick sometimes about what might happen? What might take place? And the rumors that will be spread about us and things that might be said, we, we work ourselves up and get sick of what other people say about us. And, and it sounds like 2,700 years ago they had the same problems. And let me give you a little bonus this morning. That Ahaz was worried, and we get worried, but if you know who you are, 
if you know your identity in Christ, what happens outside of here doesn't matter. You know that you know that you know this is what I believe, this is who I am, and what you say don't bother me. Don't affect me whatsoever. I've, had, I've, or I've seen several quarterbacks come out here recently, and they'll say, what about this loss you had, and how does this affect you, and how does this injury? And they had this amazing saying, they go, my identity is not defined by football, but by Christ. And if we get that attitude, then it doesn't matter what goes on outside there. And, and we'll find out a little bit later, that's really what's wrong with King Ahaz. You'll understand that that's why he's so nervous, is he's not been living for God. He's a pretender. He knows, nobody knows you like you, right? And so when he finds out that somebody's going to come whip me, he's pretty worried and scared about it because he knows, I probably don't have God on my side. Now, I'm pretending that I do, but I don't. And nobody knows that like you do. And he knew that he was in trouble because he didn't have a relationship with God. And because he didn't have a relationship with God, he didn't know the prodigal son story. He didn't know that God loves a comeback story because he didn't have that relationship. And that nugget is, no matter how far you are away or where you're at or where you've been, there's nothing God loves more than for you to come back. He loves a comeback story. Now, in verse 4 of this, of this story uh, from Isaiah, here's what God has told Isaiah. Now, Isaiah has went and he's sharing it with his people. So the prophet is saying in Isaiah 4, Tell them not to worry about those two burned-out embers. Ooh. Does that make any sense to you at all? Is there anybody that comes to mind when it says, don't worry about what those two burned-out embers are saying? That's pretty strong. He said, don't worry about these two washed-up kingdoms and these kings that keep spreading these rumors. They're burned-out embers embers so many good messages in this scripture but we're looking for the christmas message which comes a little bit further but isaiah tells ahaz don't worry about it they're just burned out embers don't worry let's move on so now in verse six and seven god tells isaiah to tell them it's true what they say israel is wanting to come whoop you judah it is it's true but the strong and the powerful and the good part is one scripture further in verse 7 where it says, but this is what God says. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Yes, they want you to get fired. Yes, they hope you fail. Yes, they're planning your demise. But it doesn't matter because all that matters is what God says. And he says, not going to happen. I want you to take that word this morning. That's a bonus to the message. This is not the Christmas message you're going to get this morning. This is a bonus. I want you to know this and buried in the description that is, it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they want. What does God say about you? What are God's plans for you? He has the final say. And you should be encouraged. You should be encouraged in confidence that the person the God, the entity that has the final say-so in your life is your daddy. It's your father. How much more can the cards be stacked in your favor when your daddy has the final say-so? Leave here knowing that you may be in the 700 years waiting period, but the promise is not going to happen. Not going to overcome you. God has a final, your heavenly father has a final say so. Now, verses 10 through 12, same story. Isaiah is still talking to King Ahaz, and he tells him, he goes, all right, they do want to get you. It's not going to happen. And God says, I can give you a miracle, a sign to prove that it's not going to happen. Ask for anything. There's nothing too big. There's nothing too small. There's no, nothing too deep. Nothing you can ask for will be too much of a sign or a miracle for me to prove to you that you're going to be okay. And King Ahaz, trying to be holier than thou, Sister Betty, better than you, goes, oh, no, I'll never test the Lord my God. But the truth is, he wasn't being holy. The truth is, like I said earlier, nobody knows you like you. And he knew, um... I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I'm not living like I'm supposed to be. 
I don't even spend time with God. I'm not asking you to do anything. That was the truth. Because nobody knows you like you. He says, I don't want a sign. You ain't got to send me a sign. Now Isaiah says, don't worry about it. I'll give you the sign. You're going to get one. And here's where our Christmas story begins. This is where it gets good, right? In verse 14. Isaiah says, this is the sign that will take place. I've told you this stuff won't happen. Now the sign that you'll know I'm telling you the truth is, a virgin will give birth to a child. They will call him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. What? To us, it's not so strange because we're 2,000 years after. But at that time, they're going, you're telling me the God who parted the Red Sea is going to come down here with us as a baby? It's crazy. Not going to happen. The God who spoke all this in existence, this big, great, big God who we have a picture of fire in the sky is not coming for a little bitty baby. It's not going to happen. But 700 years later, it took place. The prophecy come to pass just as Isaiah had said. Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary in a manger at Bethlehem, exactly like the prophecy said. This is a crazy idea, but here's the thing. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. We want to take this Christmas story the, the miracle that God said, look, this is what I'm telling you. This is the promise. This is the miracle that says it's going to come to pass. This is the evidence. I want you to take that this morning and remember this. Put this in you right here. We must believe God can do the miraculous. No God is able to do the unthinkable. Our minds can't comprehend the supernatural answers he can provide. Don't put limits on God. Believe big. Never lose the joy that comes from knowing your father, the one who spoke all this into existence, the one who called the dead to rise. That father is on your side and able to do all these miracles and so much more. If God can do these miracles like these, what obstacle in your life is too big for him? Really? If he parted the Red Sea, is the bank account really that tough? If he told Lazarus to wake up and get out, I know you're dead, but wake up, is the marriage that too unreconcilable? What prayer are you looking for that's too big for God? And if he was willing to send his only son from heaven down here to watch him be beaten and tortured and bloodied, and drug around, and eventually put on a cross, and, and just driving nails through his hands and his feet. If he was willing to give you his son, and watch all of that take place, what would he look at you and go, no, that's too much. You asked for too much. I can't do that. If he would sacrifice his son, what prayer is so far that he'd go, no, you've asked for too much now. Put yourself in that situation. If you're willing to give your son for somebody, your daughter for somebody, your child, you're willing to give up your child for somebody, is there anything worse than that? What you have to realize is if he was willing to do that, he's willing to answer anything else that you need. And he's able to do that because we've seen the miracles that he's done. The answer is not too difficult for him. Tomorrow might be your miracle. Next week might be your miracle. 2020 might be your year, but I can promise you this. You won't have to wait 700 years like Israel did. It won't have to be that long. He did the unthinkable. He did the unthinkable by delivering his son in amazing display through a miraculous conception. Then he did the unthinkable and put his son on the cross, watched his son die for us. And at the age of 12, Jesus is sitting in the temple, and he's, everybody's looking for him. They're following him, and he goes, what are you doing? At age 12, he said, I'm doing my father's work. I'm doing my father's business. I'm on a mission. I've got something to do. And at 33, as he hung on the cross, and the blood was coming out, he rose up his head, and he looked at us, and he said, it is finished. It's done. What's done? The mission is done. 
Mission completed. God's rescue mission for you, it's done. Isaiah gave a promise from God that he was sending a Savior for the world. His name would be called Emmanuel. Done. Check that one off the list. Isaiah said a sign would be given. It would be a virgin birth. Mary just did that. Done. Check it off the list. Mission accomplished. Unto us a Savior is born. Given to you and me a Savior is born. The promise was made. The signs took place. And now we have to realize there's a Savior for us. Unto us a Savior was given. Now here's a question to you. Who needs a Savior? I'm lonely. I'm tired of being lonely. I'm depressed. I'm unhappy. I need a Savior. I've been hurt physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially. I've been hurt. I need a Savior. I'm sick. I'm sick of being sick. It's constantly something coming up. I feel like I'm breaking down. I need a Savior. And maybe the most important one is when you reach the place where you say, I'm lost, I'm confused, I don't know where else to turn, I don't know where else to go, that is the perfect place and the perfect person who needs a Savior. Don't we all need a Savior sometime? Have all of us been in the place where we said, I'm done, I'm finished, I quit, I'm tired of losing, I'm tired of trying, I'm done. But the fact is, we can't. We shouldn't. Because if God fulfilled his promises by giving us a Savior through a virgin birth, he'll fulfill those other promises. And one of those promises that's important to me is God said, I'm going to prepare a place for you where there are many mansions. And guess what? In one of those mansions, I hope in several of those mansions, is some people I want to see again. I can't give up. I can't let them down. They're waiting on me. I want to see them. I can't give up and be the one that drops this ball because God's fulfilled his promise. Mission accomplished. And you can't give up either. And I know it's tough sometimes. I know it's lonely. It's miserable sometimes. But unto us, me and you, a Savior was born for those situations. I want want to take a few moments. I want you to stand. I want everybody to stand. Just take a few moments. And as the music plays, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about the message. And ask yourselves questions that were in this message. Number one, do you need a Savior? Savior from a situation or Savior from this world, a Savior from hell, and you're ready to make sure that you know, that you know, that you know that when this world ends, I'm going to one of those mansions. Ask yourself the question, am I at a place where I want to give up? And I need to tell God right now, I promise I'm not. I know what I said last night in my bed. I know what I said this week at work, but I was just words. I promise I'm not giving up. Is that something you need to say this morning? Just take a few minutes and focus. This word, these messages, the things that are delivered from here to you, if you don't take them and meditate on them and eat them and just think about them, they're useless. They're vain. There's no sense in it. You're just here to watch me just spew. You have to take some time after you hear this and ask yourself, am I here? Does this apply to me? Here's what I want you to know. This altar is always open. Always. And there's nothing God likes better than seeing somebody come to the altar. Because when you come to the altar, that's telling God, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I love you. I haven't been here in a while, but I love you. I need you. I want you. But the thing is, you don't have to come to the altar. The altar can be right there in the seat that you're in. 
You can reach out to God right there and tell him exactly what you want him to hear. I love you. I trust you. I believe in you. I need you. Now, I know the dynamics that we have here are a little different, and it's tough sometimes for this. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you just for a few moments to every eye be closed. Every eye. All eyes closed. Give God the reverence. Give God the respect. And give your neighbors, give your friends, give your family some privacy. And all eyes are closed. And if you made one of those steps today, whether it was a small step saying, I'm going to do better at work, a small step saying, I'm going to be nice at the Christmas get-together, whether it was a huge step going, i got to know that I know that I know that I'm saved. Whatever that step was, if you took that step, we want you to raise your hand right now. Because we want to get you a card to help you take the next step. We want to be there for you. Keep your hands raised to some of these people. Some of our leaders can find you and get a card in your hand so that we can be the next step, so we can take the next step with you. Because we were not made to do this life alone. And that's exactly what this card is representing. You're saying, I need God. I need, I need love. I need peace. I need joy. I need kindness. And I want the next step. Let us get this in your hands. Father, we pray right now. We come to you right now and we tell you that we believe all your promises will come to pass. We trust you with all of our life. We love you. We thank you. But today's the day when we look at you and go, it's not always great, God. It's not always good. It's tough. And we're just admitting that we need some help. We're just being vulnerable, God, telling you that we love you, we trust you, we believe you, and we need you. God, we need you. We're tired of doing this on our own. We're tired of trying to make it through this by ourselves. We're close to giving up. We're close to quitting. But we realize now, God, because you gave your only son to die for us, that's too much of a gift for us to waste. Jesus, it's in your name that we pray, we trust, and we believe all these things are possible. Amen.